Should we begin? <clears throat> You're in charge. Okay, yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna roll it. Let's see. Welcome to Why Not Change the World, the RPI podcast. I'm Mary Martilai, and on this episode, we're talking about nature and how it is impacted by human activities. I'm here with Jen Hurley, a career development chair in the Department of Biological Sciences at Rensselaer. Hi, Mary. Thanks for having me. And Rick Vellier, the director of the Darren Freshwater Institute at Rensselaer and director of an initiative called the Jefferson Project. So to start us off, Rick, can you explain what the Jefferson Project at Lake George is? Hi, Mary. The uh, Jefferson Project is really an effort to understand what uh, human activities are doing to fresh water. And it's doing it with really advanced technology, including advanced sensors and uh, computer modeling efforts to understand what's happening in terms of human impacts. And Jen, you focus on circadian rhythms. Can you explain briefly what those are and how your work relates to the idea of humans impacting nature? So circadian rhythms are... Uh, an organism's way of dealing with the light dart cycle that we have on our planet. Uh, when it comes to human biology, circadian rhythms control up to 80% of the genes in our body, which is pretty substantial. Uh, as humans, we are also uh, affecting the environment in ways like ex exposing ourselves to light at night that we shouldn't be. And this actually impacts our circadian rhythms. And so um, by changing environmental conditions, we are drastically impacting the uh, about 80% of the genes in our body at any given time. Um, you guys worked together on a project that got quite a bit of attention. It's a really interesting project. So can you talk a little bit about what you did, what you learned, what it means for both fields? So I, I guess I think Rick should start because really it was over dinner that uh, Rick kind of came up with uh, how his research could impact ours. Oh, well, we started with um, an experiment. <clears throat> this is during the summer where we raised uh, a whole bunch of things that live in the water. Uh, insects and zooplankton, et cetera, and we raise them with different amounts of road salt. And what we're simulating is road salt pollution that happens um, throughout the winter and spring in streams and lakes. And what we found was was quite interesting, which was um, the, the zooplankton in the water, when they were exposed to salt, they died in really high numbers. Um, but after a couple of months, they seemed to start coming back. And they came back, we uh, hypothesized, just because... Um, there were probably among the millions of zooplankton, probably a few that were lucky enough to have a mutation and, uh, and, didn't, uh, and didn't die. And then they came back strong by the thousands. And that made us think that, well, it looks like within a couple of months, these zooplankton are able to evolve resistance to road salt pollution. And then Jen, having come on board at RPI and knowing that she worked on circadian rhythms, we had this idea of, I wonder if there's any downside to evolving high tolerance to, to a pollutant like road salt. And uh, that's where we, uh, we started working with Jen to understand what might it do to circadian rhythms in these animals. And I have to be pretty honest, when we got started on this project, I told Rick that the chance of it working was close to nothing <laughs> because the circadian field was, and still in many ways, believes that the circadian clock is impervious to environmental influences. If it was, then temperature changes affecting the clock would make the clock a thermometer, not a clock. And so when Rick broached the subject, I thought, well, okay, it's worth a shot, but it's probably not going to find anything. So what we decided to do first was just establish in Daphnia that there's truly a circadian rhythm, which one of our uh, a student that worked with us, Gayla Coldsnow, was able to beautifully show that there's oscillations in these Daphnia over circadian time. And then she took her uh, Daphnia that had been exposed to these road salts and she asked what happened to these rhythms. And I was shocked. I, in fact, I made her redo the experiment three times before I was satisfied because she showed the more salt these organisms were exposed to, the more affected the circadian clock was. And so that was a, a really big surprise for us. Um, and w so what does that mean for, for both fields? That's what you learned. What does it mean for both fields? Well, I'd say for, for our field, you know, the, the, these zooplankton, they naturally undergo these daily cycles. At nighttime, they go up to the surface of the water to feed on algae. And, uh, during the daytime when the sun comes up, they go into deep waters trying to hide from fish so they don't get eaten by fish. We suspect that they really need their circadian rhythm to kind of know what time it is during the day, when to go up, when to go down, uh, when to eat algae, when to hide out from fish. And now instead of having this circadian rhythm, this molecular clock inside their bodies, when they have evolved high tolerance of salt, 
they effectively flatline. And that's what Kayla Cold Snow in our lab showed, that these animals do not have a clock anymore. That is, they should uh, internally not be able to tell what time it is. And that probably has a big effect, and that's something we're working on to understand. Does it have a big effect on uh, the whole lake ecosystem if animals that are supposed to go up at night and down during the day can no longer do that? It should have a lot of impacts on the entire ecosystem. I want to come back to, you're working on it right now, but first, if you don't mind. Well, I also want to follow up with that. So right at the time that Rick and I published the paper, there was another paper, I think it came out of Stanford, am I right? That um, was showing that Daphnia and its movement in the deal vertical migration actually has effect on mixing water, huh. right? So by affecting uh, the the rate that the clock is running, it could actually affect whether or not water is mixing and that can affect ocean currents. So that was a real big shocker for me because I never even thought that broadly about what I was doing. I'm used to thinking about what molecule interacts with what. So the fact that something as small as the clock running could affect ocean currents is is crazy. That's a little bit like a chaos theory, right? The idea that uh, the beating of a butterfly's wings could somehow on the other side of the planet result in a you know hurricane or something. Well, which we see all over biology. And there's this idea of protein allosteria where you move one end of the protein and the other end moves. And so on the molecular level, that exists. And so to see it existing on a higher order in ecology is is just exciting for me. Yeah, and I would say, you know, in terms of the butterfly metaphor, it's more like having a billion butterflies flapping their yeah. wings a certain way because you're talking about something that's really small. You know, these things are like a millimeter in size, but there are billions of them in the lake, the ocean, et cetera. Um, so if, uh, if, in fact, you mess up their ability to know what time it is and if that affects their ability to migrate every day, um, you are messing up the ability of billions of them to do that, and that's where the effect probably will come in. Mm. And, and you said you're following up on that. How? What are you doing? Well, right now we've been looking at whether the um, animals that have this tolerance to road salt and don't have the clock, whether they can actually uh, um, migrate up and down in the water uh, without the um, cues from sunlight and, and, uh, and nighttime darkness. Um, and we're still working on that. We don't know the answer yet. Mm. Are, is this something that you're also pursuing? Uh, so we've been working in collaboration on this. I'm much more molecular in the stuff that I do, but I was going to ask a question if I could. Uh, you had talked about doing predator stuff too. Have you guys been integrating predator cues? Because this is another thing that Rick has taught me, is that not only do rhythms maybe drive teal vertical migration, but you also have things like predator cues in the environment. And so That's right. So predator cues are, are a big part of what drives these animals to go up and down in the water column. And that is the, it's the smell of fish in the water that scares the heck out of these animals. And that's what drives them to go down during the daytime. Fish are visual predators. So if you dive down into the deeper water, if these tiny zooplankton do that, they're less likely to be seen and therefore less likely to be eaten. So the predator cues probably play a, um, a pretty big role in uh, driving these animals uh, down during the day and up during the night. Sunlight and, and darkness probably also play a role Right now, we don't know how much of this clock really has to be internal and versus how much external cues like sunlight um, can be used by these animals to know what time of day it is. In most animals, it's sort of a combination of the, the sunlight and the darkness kind of trains your internal clock, and then you use that internal clock just like, you know, when you, say, fly to Europe and it, and it changes your clock, and you have to adjust after a few days. Most animals do it a similar way. Mm. So it definitely sounds like you guys have learned a lot from each other. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you've brought back to your work? Well, I was, I was going to follow up on that. So the, the predator cues and, and the light. So what we know about the circadian clock is that it will run. You can stick a human in a cave for months and the clock keeps running. So it doesn't need external cues, but it utilizes those external cues to inform it. And so for a long time, there's been a lot of discussion about how the clock integrates environmental signals. And so I'm really interested on, on what Rick comes up with for predator stuff because I think that there's going to be a lot of information there about how the clock takes whatever predator cues are around and then decides what to do with them. And would you be able to do anything with that in your own work? Uh, well, the hope is definitely. So what we know based on the Daphne clock, which is very similar to a mammalian clock, actually, is that there's lots of different points where it can take in information on the molecular level. And I won't go too far into the details of the, the proteins that interact. But because we know all the players in the game, we can ask if there's anybody new coming in. So if Rick knows that a certain predator cue will trigger the clock to shut down, 
then we can perhaps use that cue to trigger something in the Daphnia to see how the clock changes at the molecular level. And so that's uh, one of the integration points that's really exciting for me and, and for a lot of the circadian field because we have for a very long time focused on how this mechanism works, what proteins touch what other proteins to make this all happen. But what, how the outside reaches in and influences that clock is really a, a new field in circadian biology. I would say from, from our point of view, it's, it's changed the way I think about things in that, you know, ecologists often think of uh, these evolutionary changes as genetic changes. <clears throat> and in fact, in this case, I'm, I'm convinced it's probably not a genetic, but in what we call an epigenetic change. It is just a modification to the, to the uh, genes. It isn't really genetic, um, but it's something that you can cause to happen in a really short period of time, faster than, say, waiting for a mutation, selecting on the mutation the way we think of, say, pesticides acting uh, on mosquitoes or something, where you really have to have the evolution of changes in genes. But instead, you may have a modification of the genes in, in, in a way that we call epigenetic, and that would be way faster. Mm. And I think that may be what's happening here, because this this evolution is maybe in about um, 10 generations and, say, two months that's still incredibly fast. Um, the other thing that's opened up is the idea of thinking about, do we see this in the wild? Do we see this in really salt-polluted places? And can we mimic all of this with something like uh, the CRISPR technology, something Gen's lab might do, to think about, can we genetically modify Daphnia in a really specific way to say that is, in fact, the way evolution is modifying these animals. And uh, that would be really exciting if we could do that, to actually duplicate what evolution is doing in nature. And we can even extend that beyond uh, just Daphnia into the idea of human biology, because there's been some very interesting work recently on the fact that as we age, the rhythms in our body actually change. And so it's possible that the same way Daphnia integrates these message messages epigenetically from the environment, we might be doing the same thing. And so we can take what we learn in these Daphnia and say, well, perhaps the human brain is incorporating messages the same way, and that's leading to increased rates of Alzheimer's disease or cancer or lots of other different things. And so we, we have a lot of different links that we can bring in from ecology. I want to come back to that, but I had another question first, which, um, you know, you both work on such completely different scales, but I want to come back to that idea. Um, Jen, you're looking at omics, this um, massive amounts of data from different aspects of biology um, and uh, data generated from the activity of individual cells. Rick, you're looking more at the ecosystem level. And can you talk a little bit about how your approaches differ? What kind of information you get from examining your respective scales? So when it comes to my scales, we work really in molecular biology. So we're looking at every RNA and every protein that is in each individual cell. And that, uh, that means that we're doing some pretty refined and, and highly specific experiments. There can be no mess uh, in the lab type of thing. Um, but once the data is out and once we know how these proteins are changing over time, uh, it's actually very similar to analyzing data on Rick's level because they're simply just data points. What they mean is interpreted differently if they're molecules or ecosystems. But I think Rick and I both work with uh, IDEA here at Rensselaer to manage the large volumes of data and model what information we can glean from those large models of data. Yeah, I agree. We, you know, we both generate massive amounts of data. We do it in very different ways. For example, the, the work we do on the Jefferson Project is, um, it, you know, a series of sensors all around the lake. There's about 500 sensors around, under, above the lake. Um, we crossed about 500 million data points recently. It's a massive amount of data. Um, but it's really uh, at, at the scale of, say, from the, the chemistry of the water, the physics of the water, to the biology. And the biology sort of uh, picks up where, where Jen's group leaves off. That is, we start with the individual, we go up to populations, we go to food webs, and then all the way up to, into whole ecosystems. Um, certainly generally not as sort of controlled and sterile uh, as you have to do for, say, molecular biology. Um, but... Uh, an awful large group of people who are, you know, on lakes, streams, studying the weather, uh, developing computer models of the weather and how water runs off the mountains and how it all runs into the lake and how that all affects the food web. Um, 
So an awful lot of data, but again, I agree, you know, we essentially analyze it in very similar ways. It's just very complex and a large amount of it. What, what interests me about that is if you pull back from the specific instances that you're looking at from the molecular level, from the ecosystem level, you've both seen um, over time and in various experiments and investigations, what are the outcomes of kind of messing with a natural system? So, you know, you've probably had a chance to ponder that. Um, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are as you look around you and look at how our world is changing, the direction that it's going, how we, uh, the regulations that we choose or don't choose. What you know? What are the bigger lessons that you're taking about um, about messing with natural systems? I think over time is kind of the key uh, because our timescales are really different. So I'm really concerned about what happens in just a 24 hour span. And I think it's interesting how you can connect the changes in 24 hours to changes that happen over decades, like Rick has been tracking. And I think that that makes a really big difference in terms of how we think about biology on a regular basis, uh, how small actions in a, a single organism can have such long term, large scale uh, effects in in the ecosystem itself, and I think that's probably one of the, the fun parts about this scientific collaboration for me is it's very rare that beyond the 24 hours that I look at mm. that I really get to see the effect on the organism, uh, and so to be able to envision how tiny little molecules that go up and down over the day can make in 20 years current stop running or uh, populations die off just because they were exposed to one other tiny chemo chemical as simple as something like road salt. I would say what's really uh, the thing that I've learned among several is the amazing amount we still have to discover. We are perpetually surprised in, in a really positive way um, at what, um, what human impacts can do. I mean, recently we showed, for example, that being exposed to road salt can cause sex changes in animals. No one had a clue that that was even a possibility. We've seen it in pesticides. We've seen it in other places. There is still so much uh, to be discovered, whether it's just the basic biology or human impacts on, on biology. That we still have a long way to go. And, and I would think uh, in many cases we couldn't have dreamed of the stuff that we're discovering now even five years ago. And that's really, I think, for all of us scientists, what keeps us going is it's so fun. It's so exciting to have that moment of discovery, that sort of aha moment. Um, and we still have an awfully long way to go. You, you both live surrounded by artificial products. You know, you, you, you go near your shower curtain and you know there's endocrine disruptors in the vinyl. And um, I know you looked um, for a long time at pesticides. Right. Um, and, and just the way our society <clears throat> handles things is kind of putting chemicals out there and seeing what happens. The one that I, I had in mind at the moment was vaping because it's in the news. Um, you know, it was just sort of allowed to move forth, and now it turns out to be a big problem. And kind of what are the larger lessons that you can draw from the work that you've done about how we operate as a society in accepting um, you know, the, 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 the results of, of, of human innovation and activity in our lives, what it does to biology, if, if that makes sense. Well, there's, there's an interesting contrast. Uh, when you say our society, if you mean the U.S. society, it's an interesting contrast how we approach things versus how other countries, particularly uh, European countries, approach things. We have the approach when it comes to products of, uh, and it's called the, the innocent until proven guilty approach. That is, um, until you can prove that something is harmful, it's, it, uh, it goes on the market. Uh, the European approach is called the precautionary principle, which means that if there's any suggestion it might be harmful, you need to prove it's not before it goes on the market. Now, the downside of that is it takes a lot longer to get things to market, and there's a lot of cost and, of investing all that R&D. Um, but the upside, uh, and, and people have to decide whether this is worth the, the benefit and the cost, the upside of, of the U.S. Uh, approach is that products get to market much faster, whether it's medications or, uh, or, or, uh, or chemicals, pesticides, et cetera. Um, but we have enough examples where we uh, probably have some regret that things went to market so fast without knowing the full impact uh, of some of these chemicals, um, even though you know, there might have been some warning signs early on uh, that uh, uh, should concern us. Uh, I would say that from my perspective, um, that 
uh, from the circadian perspective, at least, that I would have told you not to worry about it until Rick and I started working on this project because we really had the idea that it should be very much protected. And beyond circadian biology, we can argue about how much human biology is affected by pesticides and that kind of thing. But this project has really gotten me thinking circadianly about what we expose ourselves to. The one caveat to that is something even simpler than pesticides and things that nobody thinks about, and that is turning on your lights at night. So by turning on your light at night, you're actually disrupting your circadian rhythms. And if you do that over your lifespan, your increasing rate of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, anything you can think of is probably impacted by disruption of light at night. And that's something that as a society, we don't think about very much at all. So I think that from the circadian perspective, I, I would take even a step back and say that any changes that we have really made into our environment, we really don't understand what we have done. And some of them are obviously amazing, right? The idea that we have antibiotics around to treat our infections is huge. What that does long term to an organism, we don't know. But in the short term, if, you know, it's really important to have. But I think every single change that we have made to our environment will make a difference in human biology as well as environmental biology. And I think that scientists who approach it in the way that Rick and I do, where we're looking at instead of just one particular element, you're looking at how it fans out into the network of society and of ecology, that's really where we need to be asking questions, not how does it just affect me? How does this affect everything downstream of me? Because that's really the scale that we're talking about. Like I said, molecules can affect ecosystems yeah. and, and we're realizing that more and more these days. So this is your chance to take an optimistic or pessimistic point of view. <laughs> you know, if we're just beginning to understand what um, what the impact might be um, on a molecular level or an ecosystem level, and we have so many human-made compounds and behaviors instilled in our environment, in the long run, do you think that there's a way that um, it's possible for humans as a technological species to live in harmony without disrupting nature to the point where we harm it, including our own natural systems? Well, I would say um, for a little perspective, if you think about the quality of the environment, in many ways, it is so much better than it was 30, 40 or 50 years ago. You know, we don't have rivers on fire like we used to. We don't have DDT being sprayed in the U.S. like we used to. It's still manufactured um, and used elsewhere, such as in Africa. But an awful lot of things are much better than they used to be. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't ha still have concerns. You know, we we uh, we used to think about acid rain in the Northeast and uh, in the '60s and '70s, and now we all take that to be, you know, something that we've uh, we found solutions to, and it's much much better. But now we have global ch climate change being debated, and uh, and it's really the the same kind of situation. We have uh, a number of companies who uh, are. Uh, um, sort of dedicated toward efforts that uh, are causing global climate change. And, and we push on things like it's not happening, it's not real, or if it's real, it's not our fault, or if it is our fault, uh, we can't afford to fix it. Mm -hmm. Those are the same exact claims made for things like acid rain 40 years ago. Um, and some of these things just take generations of people to learn about and accept and I suspect things like global climate change will be the same way. That is, it will take a generation to sort of understand that it's happening, it's real, it's human caused, and there are ways to deal with it. And it's also the, the sign of that is uh, we have more and more corporations, uh, U.S. government agencies, et cetera, all saying that it is real, it's happening, it's human caused. Uh, so some of these things are going to get better. And uh, at the same time, as you mentioned, there are new chemicals always coming on board. So... Um, Hopefully, we learn from the past uh, errors in bringing some of those chemicals on board and using them and uh, thinking about how we can do that in a smarter way next time. I think that humans have, have been around for a very long time, and we've had an enormous impact on biology and environment well before we were dumping chemicals into any streams and rivers. And uh, I think the difference between then and now is that we have an awareness of what we're doing. And as Rick pointed out, with awareness comes the ability to change those things that we have made mistakes on. And we are definitely making mistakes every day. Every time science puts out something new, it has the potential to be a mistake as well as a real benefit to society. And I, I agree with Rick that it takes a generation at least to realize it and to find what we need to do about it and to implement that change. 
And the more we vocalize it and the more we talk about it and the more we make everybody aware of what impact they could be having both on human biology and the planetary biology, then the, the better off we're going to be. I think that, um, that it's hard when you're standing on the precipice of the problem to be able to say, this can be fixed, we can do this. But it, when you look back at how big that hill was, it doesn't look so bad once you've, you've overcome it. And I think that we just need to recognize it looks like a really big problem right now, whether it be global climate change or exposure to pesticides or Superfund sites that are all over the place these days. Uh, all of them are theoretically surmountable if we have the time and the will to do so. And we just have to really work on the will. And it's better now than it ever was, I think. And I think hopefully it continues to get better because we need it to get better in order to make that change happen. Well, I don't know that I expected you guys to to have such a positive note, but it's a good note to close on. Um, I like it. <laughs> so Jen, Rick, thank you for joining us. This episode of Why Not Change the World was recorded in the soloist suite of MPAC, the Curtis R. Priam Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center. Thank you to the MPAC staff for their assistance, and thank you for listening. Thank you.